Seches Ksubis, Daf Lamed Ches, contains one Mishnah, which divides the Daf into two Sugis. The first Sugis is the Gemara's attempt to explain why we have two Psukim that both seem to say the Halacha that someone who is guilty of the death penalty cannot get his way out of it by paying a kofir, by paying a monetary fine. The Gemara has those two Psukim. The Gemara will explain three different attempts to explain why we need the two sets of psukim. Then we'll get to the Mishnah, which will introduce the topic of a Nara who was married through Kedushin only and divorced from Kedushin if she later has a Pasha of Knas. My focus on the topic and what the sources are and how each one explains the other's psukim. So let's begin. The Gemara has two psukim. One says, Kolcherim, Asher Yecharam and Adam Lo Yipadem Mos Yimas. Anyone who commits a capital crime has to be given a capital punishment. He cannot pay instead. And there's also a pasuk that says, Lo sikhel kofer, lenefesh rotzeach, he cannot take a payment for the soul of a murderer. These two psukim both seem to be saying that if you did something which requires the death penalty, you cannot pay a kofer instead of the death penalty. And why do we need both of them for it? So the most first attempt we've already seen is that there's two types of killing someone. One is if you kill him in an upward stroke, one is if you kill him in a downward stroke. Those are very different because had it been a shogeg, one would trigger the Carlos, that the person has to go to exile, but the other one does not. So these are two different types of things. So if we're talking about a mazid, so you need those those two types of killing someone, but mazid, we need two separate circum to show that for each of them, you cannot get out of it by paying kofar. Says the Gemara, this is not correct. You don't need to psukim for that because you have a different source for it. And the Gemara says that Rava shows that it's from Tan de Bechiskia, which we've seen earlier in the parak as well, who says that there is a hekesh between someone who hits an animal and someone who hits a person. It says Maka Adam and Maka Behema in the same pasuk. And we learn just like the rules of hitting an animal are uniform, there is no difference between whether you hit it on purpose, by accident, with Kavana, without Kavana. In an upward stroke or in a downward stroke, the rules are uniform. In all those ways, you are uh, chayev to pay. Same thing applies to hitting a person. All the rules are uniform. There's no difference between an upward stroke and downward stroke. A shogig or a maze, kavana or not kavana. He gets the death penalty and he doesn't pay and therefore also can't dis- cannot pay his way out of it. So we see clearly, therefore, that that's enough of a source to tell me that there's no difference between an upward stroke and a downward stroke, and it wouldn't make sense that I need two psukim for that. So the Gemara, therefore, needs to find a different answer. So Gemara introduces Rabbi Barchama. Rabbi Barchama says this is to talk about the Kamli Vidur Rabbi Mine, where somebody, let's say he hits someone's eye, and that's a monetary payment he has to pay, but at the same time, he kills the person. So there's two different ways that could happen. One could be with one blow. He hits him in his eye, and that blow kills him, knocks out his eye, and kills him. And the other thing, that could be two separate blows that were simultaneous. He hit his eye, and he hit him in the heart. And those are two different blows which happen at the same time. So you need two psukim to show that for both of these, you don't pay for the eye. Again, it's not about knas here. He says it's about kamli bin And it's to show that you don't pay in either of these. Not only in the two different things in the same action. That's one blow that but knocked out an eye. And he killed him. Also, if it was two different blows and they were just simultaneous, you wouldn't have to pay for each of those. Now, the Gemara says this is also not correct, because you could also derive this from a Tana de Bechizkia. This is from a different Tana de Bechizkia. This Tana de Bechizkia is proving that when the Torah says, Ayin tachas ayin, nefe, uh, shein tachas shein, it's not saying to knock out somebody's eye if he knocks out someone else's eye. It's saying that it has to pay the value of the eye. And the reason is because if we were to knock out that person's eye, we might kill him, and then it would be a eye and a nefesh in place of just an eye. So it would be, and the Torah doesn't say ayin ve nefesh tachas ayin, it only says ayin tachas ayin. So the Gemara over here says also, so that's also a good source for us. It's not quite what they were discussing there in context, but this also shows that you cannot be chayef to pay for an eye and get the death penalty for one blow that knocked out a person's eye or that killed him. You cannot have ayin ve nefesh. So we see that already, and therefore we don't need a special source for that halacha either. So it says Igmar, we're still looking for an explanation of why we need these two psukim, kol cherem, and lo sikhu kofar. So the Gemara therefore offers a third answer, and this is Ravashi. 
Ravashi says that this is to tell me that there is Kamli ben Ramani on Knas as well. That we'd seen, Rabba said earlier that since Knas is a Chiddush, and Chiddush has different rules, it's not a restitution, it's a punitive payment, therefore it has different rules. So Rabba said that there is no Kamli ben Ramani on Knas. Says Rav Ashi, no, this pasuk is specifically talking about knas and saying that there's kamei rabbi and knas also. You don't have to pay knas if you get a uh, finish a a f- physical punishment as well. Says Gemara, okay, that's good. But what's Rabbi going to do? Rabbi can't use his answer because he holds that there is no kamei rabbi and if you're guilty of knas, you do pay knas as well as the physical punishment that you get. So Gemara says he will have to hold like the opinion which we saw quoted earlier in the name of the Rabbanon who argued Hanani ben Akavia, who said that if somebody's being taken out to be killed, he's taken out to be given the death penalty, and he says Erechi Alai, he doesn't have any Erech. And that's learned from Kol Cherem Haram, you don't take a kofa from him. Anybody who's in a Cherem state who's already taken out to be killed, he doesn't pay any Erech if he says Erechi Alai. Now we begin the next Mishnah, which discusses the halacha of a Nara, that is a woman between the age of 12 and 12 and a half, who should be ready to get a knas for her father if she is nenas or nispate, that is, if somebody rapes or seduces her, he has to pay a knas to her father. So the halacha of the question of the Mishnah is what happens if she was already had Kedushin to someone, but she was divorced from the Kedushin, and then afterwards this happens to her. So, we know that the Allah is she has to be a psula, but in this case she is a psula, because she only had Kedushin, but she is the, the, there is still a Machok is about the topic, and the Gemara will explain why, and go through what each one will do with the other one's psukim. So, what is the Machok? So, Rabbi Yasei Haglili says, the uh, Mishnah says, once she's married and divorced, even if it's only married for Kedushin, she does not get Knas anymore. It's, so, she's already out. Rabbi Kiva says, no, she still gets Knas. However, the Knas is different than the Knas of a woman who was never married. Knas of a woman who was never married goes to her father. Here, since she was married once, she's out of her father's Rishos, and the Knas goes to her. All right, the Gemara begins now. The Gemara says, let's explain the source of each one. Rabbi Yosef Haglili is a pretty straightforward source. The Torah, when it's describing the Parsha of Knas, that a woman who is Nenas or Nisbate gets Knas, and it, it, it says it specifically by a woman who is Nenas, that she gets Knas, and the Knas goes to her father, that entire Parsha says, Asher loy a woman who is never engaged. This woman was engaged, so it doesn't apply to her. So you see, therefore, she does not get Knas. What is Rabbi Kiva going to do with that? So Rabbi Kiva says it's true that it doesn't apply to her, but it doesn't, not the way that you said it. It's not that it doesn't apply to her because she doesn't get any knas. It doesn't apply to her because the knas doesn't go to her father. The knas goes to her, and therefore she gets to keep the knas, and that's why it's different. So it's going to hold on a second. Rabbi Kiva could say that. He could say that the halachos of, that are written to limit the parsha of knas is to say that only if you have what's, what it specifically says there, does the knas go to the father, but otherwise there's still knas, but it goes to her. If that's true, then there's a lot of other halachas he should say, which he doesn't say. For example, the parasha of knas is only talking about a naira. Well, it'll be if it's a bulgaris, above age 12 and a half. So we assume she doesn't get knas at all. According to Rabbi Kiva, why don't you say she still gets knas, but she gets to keep it. It doesn't go to the father, just like he said about lo arasa. Same thing about the fact that it says psula. Maybe she's not a psula, she should still get knas. And the parsha doesn't apply in the sense that her father can't get her knas, but she can get her own knas. So the Gemara therefore seems to reject this answer, and the Gemara goes to a different answer. The Gemara says Rabbi Kiva is going to say that the word lo arasa, not engaged, is extra. And it's not meant to apply here, it's meant to make a Xerah Shava. And the Gemara quotes a Brisa at length, which con- which actually contradicts our mission in one sense, but it showcases the same Achlokes, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Yisadli. The Brisa says, similar to our Mishnah, the Brisa says, what is the halacha of a woman who was engaged and divorced? Rabbi Yisadli says, like he says here, uh, she doesn't get any knas at all. Rabbi Kiva says she does get knas. Here it's different. Here Rabbi Kiva says the knas goes to her father. Still goes to her father. 
Now, here, the Brysa continues, and it says that Rabbi Akiva gives his source. Rabbi Akiva says that it's logic, simple, straightforward logic. A father has two things that he's entitled to for his daughter, who's an Arab. He's entitled to her Kesef Kedushin. He's entitled to marry her off and take the Kedushin money for himself. And if she's raped, he's entitled to get the Knas. Now, just like Kesef Kedushin applies, even if she was already married through Kedushin only and divorced from that, he gets, and if she gets Kesef Kedushin again, he gets that. So the same thing should apply to Kanas, that he will still get the Kanas, even if she was had Kedushin from someone and was divorced from that Kedushin, the Kanas money should still go to the father. And it's logical. So therefore, the question is, what does Ashala Orasa mean? The phrase Ashala Orasa is empty, is extra. So Rebekiva says it's meant to link Kanas and Mafuta, and we learn a halacha from each to the other. We learn that it's 50 shekels. It says the number 50 specifically by one and not by the other. We learn that it's 50. And it says that it's shekels specifically by one and not by the other. We learn that therefore the coin denomination has to be shkola. So in order to link the two, you have asher lo or rasa, which it says by both of them to link them. So now the Gemara asks, why does Rabbi Kiva say that the phrase lo or rasa is used for a gzeir shava? and not meant to be teaching me a literal halacha, there's a whole different phrase. The Torah says, Basula, Nara Basula, both in the parasha of a Mafuta and an Anusa. So maybe that's the Gzei Roshava, and that's not meant, meant to, and that isn't teaching me any literal halacha. And when it says, Ashalo or Asa, that is the literal halacha. And it says two things in both of them. We're taking one literally and not the other one. How do we know which one is literal and which one is meant for a Gzei Roshava? Maybe Ashalo or Asa is the literal one. She has to be that she was never engaged, but if she's engaged, there's no Kanas. And when it says, Psula, that's not literal. That's just for Gzei Roshava. And as a matter of fact, a Bu'ula, even if she was never engaged, a Bu'ula could get Kanas. Why don't we say that? So the Gemara answers, the Gemara tries to first answer, the Gemara says it's logical that the Bu'ula should lose Kanas, and then Arusa should get Kanas, because a girl who's a Psula is called a Nara Psula. She's called a Nara Psula. This is not a Nara Psula, she, so she, she doesn't qualify. The term Nara Psula that the Torah uses is the name of the girl. It's not correct to say that Psula is not literal. So the Gemara says you can say the same thing the other way. You could say she's called a Nara that was that, that's that's low Arasa, uh, uh, a girl who was never engaged. So that's also part of her identity. So you should say that that's not uh, just for Xer Shav, it has to be literal. So the Gemara therefore says that doesn't really help us. So the Gemara says no, it's just more logical. If I have to take one of the two literally and one of the two I have to say it doesn't really make a difference in whether or not she deserves Knaz. I'll say that it's whether she was engaged or not. She was engaged in divorce from engagement. Her body didn't change. She's the same. Nothing really happened. She was engaged and then she broke the engagement. All right. It's not a major change. Why should that change her halacha of Knaz? But if you say she was a Baula, so that okay, then I can understand. Well, as long as she was a psula, she had knas. So when she became a baula, her physical body changed, and therefore she's not entitled to knas anymore. Yimarno asks, "How does Rabbi Yisagili know this Gzeir How does he know to link Yifata to link Mafuta and Anusa? By Mafuta, it says clearly that it has to be Shkolim, but it doesn't say how many. By Anusa, it says clearly that it's 50, but it doesn't say Shkolim. So we link the two and we learn that they're both 50 Shkolim. So Gemara says, how does he know that? So Gemara says, that's not through any Zerah Shava. It's because in the Parsha of Mafuta, it says, Kesev Yishkal Kim Moher Habsula. So it should give Shkolim like the Moher, like the amount that's given for Habsula. So what is that referring to? It's referring to Ones. And just like by Ones, it says 50. So therefore, this is also going to be 50. And just like by Ones, is going to be, and I just like here it's Shkolem, it's also linked that that has to be Shkolem as well. All right, now the Gemara refers back to the fact that Rabbi Kiva in the Brysa contradicted Rabbi Kiva in the Mishnah. Rabbi Kiva in the Mishnah said that it has to go to her, the Knas, and then Brysa said it goes to the father. The Gemara says, Machlokas Tanoim, what Rabbi Kiva actually said. The Kiva in our Mishnah held that it goes to the father, and the version that was written by the author of the Brysa said that it goes that, said that it, uh, it goes to the father, and in our Mishnah it said that it goes to her. The Gemara now will compare these two Pshatim and Rabbi Kiva. Now, according to one that said that she gets Knas, there is Knas, but it goes to her, not to her father. So the meaning of Loa Rasa at least means something. When it says Loa Rasa, even though it's used for Xira Shava, at least it has it has a meaning in context as well. It is in well in the place that it's written, it's still teaching me that she she there there is no 
regular Parsha of Knas on a woman who was a Rasa who was engaged. There is Knas, but at least it only goes to her and not to her father. And according to the one who says that it goes to her father, so that's the version that we see in the Brisa. So then the Torah says, Ashalo or Rasa, we're totally negating that. We're saying that's completely Xerah Shava, not meant to be understood as meaning anything at all. The Pasha Pshat is totally smashed here. So Gemara says, that's Shver. Usually the Pasha Pshat has to mean something. So Gemara says, it does mean something. The Pasha Pshat here means that you read it like this. You don't read Ashalo or Rasa that she was never engaged. You read it Ashalo or Rusa that she is not engaged. If she is currently engaged, then she doesn't get kenas. That is still a true halacha. Says the Gemara, one second, if she is engaged, then uh, there's a chiv misa there. Uh, she gets skila because she's an engaged woman and she's being mizana. So how can you say that you that it's ashalo or rusa? So um, the Gemara therefore says that uh, it's the point of skila is to take away the knas because she can't get two things. She can't get both knas and skila. So the Gemara says what it means to say that uh, since knas is an extra chiddush, you may think that she could get both of them, and therefore you need the pasuk to tell me that since she's a, an arusa and she's a bas skila, she's going to get uh, knas, uh, she isn't going to get knas, you would have thought she does, because like Rabba said, it's a chiddush, and therefore Kamash Malan, that it's, she's not going to have to pay knas, because come the bitter And obviously we're referring to Mafuta here, because she's being held responsible for her actions, as opposed to Anusim, where she's not. So Gemara says, um, okay, very good, but what about according to Rabba? According to Rabba, she really isn't going to have to pay, she really is going to have to pay uh, Kanas because of what she did. So Gemara says, Rabbi must hold like Rabbi Kiva in our Mishnah that the Pashid understanding of the phrase Ashel Arasa is that she gets it and not that her father gets it. The Gemara now brings a different Brisa, which is going to relate to this Machlokas Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Wheel. Brisa says that a woman who's this Anais gets Kanas, and the Brisa asks, Who gets the Kanas? Some say it goes to her, some say it goes to the father. Where it says, what? How could there be a good discussion about that? The Pesukim clearly say it goes to the father. Where it says, this is talking about where she was this Arsa and then this Karsha, and the Machlokis is that of Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Gamil, just like we've been discussing. The Gemara now asks, what happens if the father, who's trying to claim the Knas, doesn't manage to do so until the time expires? What does it mean that the time expires? So we'll see later in the Masechta that she has to still be in Nara at the time he makes the claim in court for the Knas. If she became a Bulgaris, that she crossed the age of 12 and a half, by the time he makes the claim in court, he can't get Knas anymore. She could get the Knas from now on. If the person is found guilty, she'll get the Knas. So that's clear. That's not a shy of the question. What happens if she dies? Does the father still have a claim on the Knas or not? So Abai said it's Pashut that there's no knas anymore at all. She has to be alive. And he has a drasha, like it says, Vanessa la vihanara, not la ta aviha mesa. So the, she has to be alive. Rava is not sure. Rava asks, the way it's phrased in the Gemara initially is, does the death count as becoming a bogeres? Meaning, could she become a bogeres in the death state or not? Do we say that if she crosses six months from the day she turned 12, but she's dead at that time. She still becomes a Bulgaris, and therefore there's no Knas anymore to her, to the father. Instead, the Knas goes to her, and therefore it's inherited by her son. Or do we say that there is no such concept as a dead girl becoming a Bulgaris, and therefore she stays a Nara forever. And if the man's found guilty of class, it'll go to the father. That's the way the Gemara wants to phrase this question at first. The Gemara proves that this doesn't make sense because she can't have a son. 
uh, a katana can't give birth and an ara can't give birth either. They weren't going to go through a lengthy discussion to prove that on the next half. So where therefore says, okay, so it's not the question of whether it goes to her son, it's a question of whether the guy doesn't have to pay it at all since there's no one to collect it. The father, if being, if she could become a Bulgaris after she died, the father can't collect it and she doesn't have a child, she doesn't have any other inheritor, so the money will have to go to the person who's being forced to pay it, and you won't have to pay it at all. There's another way to phrase the question, and that's the way Shmuel phrases it. Um, he says, uh, that's the way Marbar Rav Ashi phrases it, he says, does the death itself count as a bagras? Does the moment she dies, is that can, even if she's less than 12 and a half, does, does that take her to the status of bagras, and therefore she now... Uh, no, the the father no longer has rights to the Knesset or not. That's the way he phrases it. Either way, Abayu was clear. He said that he's confident that the father does not get the Knesset. Rava and Ravashi, different ways of phrasing it, but they said that they are misopic about it.